welcome back to another episode of Nonprofit Power Week with our friends over at Ide Bailey. Specifically, we've had Jeff Hensel, one of the directors at Ide Bailey, in the hot seat all week. And we've been talking about AI, artificial intelligence. Whew. Jeff, this has been quite the conversation this week, hasn't it? It has. And I think it's incredibly timely and, and really important for all organizations, not just nonprofits, but certainly on the, on the for-profit and commercial side as well. So. Right. You know, um, I'm going to get my crib notes out. Um, this week, the uh, Nobel Prizes have been announced. We started on Monday with D Dr. Hinton, considered the godfather of AI. He won the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and machine learning. And then yesterday there was another um, announced another prize awarded in chemistry. And their whole thing was that they used AI to create this um, new framework for a, a chemical structure. Today, uh, this morning, and again, just hours ago, um, the Nobel Prize for Literature was announced. Um, an author from South Korea, the first South Korean to be um, uh, awarded this prestigious prize. And you just know that the issue of AI is going to be brought up at some point. <laughs> like, how was this uh, book edited? Was it used? I mean, um, it's just, it's here with us, right? And so what an interesting week to have these things, the confluence of this. It is, and I, and I think it's it's it is very timely again. And I do think that AI is a tool, as we've talked about a few times this week, and how you use it, and then how you make sure, as a human being, you validate and do your work, which hopefully would be less based on the artificial intelligence. But uh, how do you use that as an actual tool, not something you just depend on to do your day to day job? So right. Well, we're going to get into it because um, now today we're going to really talk about application. Um, and so before we do that, I want to definitely call out our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Again, I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Um, I want to call out two of our amazing co-hosts, Meredith Terrian and Tony Bell, are both residents of Florida. Meredith is actually based in, in Tampa, and uh, Tony Bell is on the east side. Um, so our thoughts are with them, and this is a time when nonprofits throughout this region of our country are really being asked to do some heavy lifting. Um, Hurricane Helene was only 14 days ago, and so already our nonprofits have been enmeshed in recovery and, and work along those lines. Um, it is something that has been heavy on all of our hearts, and so we definitely want to um, acknowledge that and, and ask for um, their safety because this is a, an incredibly tough time. Jeff Hensel, I have been fascinated fascinated by the, these conversations. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of touch on before we get into this application of the nonprofit uh, world <laughs> with AI is that I'm super intrigued that a nationally known accounting tax audit, I mean, one of the true experts in our country on all things accounting would have this piece of IT and technology, not necessarily just in line in alignment with the tax and audit side. I, th I think it's pretty um, pretty powerful to look at a major organization such as I Bailey and say, hey, if they're investing in this concept, um, we need to be paying attention. No matter what we do, um, you know, if you're a nonprofit or not, and so I just would like to get kind of your feedback on that. Yeah, and I, and I love that you've brought that up. I do think that I Bailey is really, you know, I know Miko brought this up yesterday when we had our conversation around the concept of a physician 
and thinking about not just the current pain point or how do I solve this single problem, but looking holistically at the patient. And that that's really the way I think about I Bailey from a firm perspective. We do really amazing work in tax and audit and assurance and all the other things that we do that is we're well known for. Mm-hmm. We also do amazing work on business advisory, meaning the holistic view of, of an organization. And that includes industry specific things like nonprofit and financial services and all the other uh, great uh, industries we serve. And part of that is technology consulting because technology is pervasive within almost any single organization today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would challenge anybody to tell me an organization that doesn't need technology to support its missions and goals. So. You know, it's really an interesting thing, Jeff, because so much of what you've said, and I suspect what you're going to say today is going to be like a light bulb going off for a lot of folks um, that we're still in a, in a time when there's a lot of fear about this entire concept of using this tool, using technology. And so how do we how do we approach it with an intelligent, logical structure? I mean, you and Miko throughout this week have both said several times, people first. Look at the culture. Look at what we need to be thinking about, um, because you brought up yesterday was just hilarious. Um, the the concept of the free puppy, not so free. <laughs> when you get the free puppy, it <laughs> might sound great for the first like ninety minutes, and then you're like, holy cow, this is gonna you know cost some resources here, <laughs> mentally, physically, and financially. Um, and so I'm, I'm very fascinated by this. I really, really am. And, and I appreciate that you've come on to kind of hold our hands, so to speak. So where is AI successfully used today? If we could start there, because I suspect we're seeing this, we're, we're using it more than we actually know. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. And I, and I think that it's, it's more attainable than a lot of organizations uh, think or, or, or understand. It's not uh, you know, uh, just a robot showing up and starting to, to do work in an organization. That's not how it works. Mm-hmm. One of the, so there's a handful of things that we see relative to artificial intelligence where clients can be successful early uh, in the adoption cycle. And we're aware that every organization and in different industries adopt technology at a different pace. But the foundation of that you know, we've talked about during the course of this series doesn't change. Security and understanding people first and understanding yeah. how you think about what it means to your organization and then beginning you know, to thinking about what you really want to accomplish with it. How does it further your mission and goals as an organization? Those are things that don't change irrespective of industry. Nonprofit is is, uh, is certainly an example of that. But one of the places specifically that we see a lot of organizations getting advantages around AI, and it's really some of the lowest hanging fruit and, and the lowest bar is around robotic process automation. So today in, in many environments, organizations have m- multiple systems of record. They might get emails in that have attachments or details in them that then people have to manually collate into other systems of record or do other things to sort of manage the data. And that takes, that's very time intensive. And really it's something that a computer can do quite well. And that's where we see a lot of sort of the starting point for AI. There's probably some folks listening on the, on the podcast that are saying, well, that's not really AI. Um, and so I would argue it, it sort of is. The key, though, is artificial intelligence plugs in very nicely to that to help make decisions once you get to to uh, the inflection point of sort of making decisions, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so one specific example I would give really quickly for a client, not in the nonprofit space, but I think it still might resonate is we worked uh, on some ro- robotic process automation for a client where they had somebody who spent four days a week doing AP processing. So AP accounts payable stuff comes in through email, it comes in through snail mail, it comes in through yep. 
yeah, just embedded in an actual email itself, not an attachment. And so we worked with them to manage that process, understand their key sort of, you know, uh, providers of services, et cetera. And then what we did is we created some RPA that allowed them to manage that in a way where it was more of a, a, a pr approval process or managed by exception versus I have to go through and, you know, look at every one of these, download it, do the, do the work. And so that actually saved them 70% of their time. And this individual, it's a small organization. This is an individual who was, um, you know, she's a, she's a big thinker. They really wanted to free up her time. And yeah. that's the beauty of what AI can do if you do it in a, you know, secure and responsible way. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff, I'm thinking about the number of nonprofit organizations throughout the country that struggle with this um, outside of accounting, simply using completely different systems for volunteer management and donor management. And, you know, everybody can agree that ultimately volunteers, it's a pipeline into donors. But then there's this conflict about, are we sending them too much information? Are we doubling up? And how, you know, how do we integrate things? I know that um, one of our sponsors, Bloomerang, um, is really moving and in, in investing in volunteer management software. Um, but still, it is kind of one of those, those pieces that um, gives people kittens, frankly. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And... And I think that's where, as we think about AI, there that's a really, you know, that's a good place to start. They're not, that is not necessarily a, a heavy investment in AI relative to the bigger picture. It's not like you're creating, you know, some sort of new algorithms and machine learning on your donor data, as an example. That would be very different mm -hmm. than some of the things that are attainable through, uh, you know, process automation and, and, and the tools that are available. So that's where, for us, it, it starts, uh, like some of the other examples I'll give, but there, it starts getting people comfortable with the concept and, and the fact that it's not going to replace their job. It's actually going to make them more effective so that they can do things that matter more for the organization. So do I hear you saying to us that we can buy, um, you know, we used to say, it at, you know, out of the box software, but but actual programs that we don't have to step back and create this whole framework for ourselves, right? That there are products out there that we can actually, you know, if you will, open up and get going. So I, I would say there's not sort of out of the box. You just buy it off the shelf. And as we talked about yesterday, like an appliance, plug it in and it works. Okay. You do need guidance. You need to map your business process a bit you ultimately would want to optimize that before you uh, before you automated it um, because a garbage process that's you automate will produce fast garbage. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And I do think that you have to do some of that work and, and the tools are while intuitive, they still require a technical acumen and um, you know, uh, certainly a technical expertise to do, and that's pervasive across the, the ecosystem of tools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th there is still some advisory work that you probably need with that, but once it's set up and running, it, it should just run and okay. you don't need to kind of have this ongoing care and feeding and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. The puppy is, is, uh, matured up at that point right? right you know i think it's really interesting um you're you've been very cautious with us today uh, or th throughout the week i've i've heard you say and it's like your tone at the top which i learned that phrase from i bailey 20 years ago at least um that be deliberate be thoughtful you just use that phrase mapping um your process try and figure this out and don't just think that it is, you know, a one and done kind of to your point, you plug it in and you and you and you run. Um, I think that that might be somewhat of a shock for a lot of organizations because they they think, oh, I've got to choose between package A, B or C and then I'm all done. Right. I mean, this is kind of an interesting 
thing that we have to get our, our heads around. And I think that's absolutely true. I also think it's, it's part of what I mentioned earlier is technology is becoming such an important part of every organization. How you do your role, your, your job, how you engage with uh, individuals, whether that's donors or volunteers or, or clients you serve, the, the world is di very different than it was 50, even 10, 15 years ago, just in terms of what people expect, the way they get that information, how they want to interact, and, and, and frankly, what will differentiate you from an organizational perspective. And that doesn't matter whether it's a nonprofit or, or you know, for-profit commercial sort of organization. And I really think that's where you, you need to think about technology as part of your core strategy. It needs to be front and center. And as part of that today, if AI is not part of that conversation, it needs to be. Yeah. I, I think that's fascinating. And, and I, I appreciate that, um, that concept. I, I spoke about this with you in the green room, and I want to bring it up because it was such a shocking thing. I met with uh, a nonprofit leader not too long ago. They were in the C-suite and um, they uh, were they were in a department that was content creating writing and they wanted to uh, bring into their system AI so that it could help with content creation, editing, mm -hmm. editing, not just 100 percent, you know, write this post. But I mean, literally um, helping as assist to the finished product. And their, their contractor said, no, you're not ready for it. It's not safe. They deal with HIPAA and they have a very large bu bu budget. So um, this provider was like, no, we're not ready to, to go there. And this um, executive confided in me that folks were just bringing in their own laptops and basically saying, well, screw that. We got to get this work done. We're going to bring in our own laptops and then we're going to cut and paste, email it through our inner office system and use it. And I was just kind of scandalized, A, that the IT person um, who was not in the conversation, so I, I wasn't able to ask questions, but that they didn't feel that the organization was ready and that it was safe and that the staff did a workaround, which I thought was kind of shocking, to be honest with you. And so that's all about how do we launch AI in our nonprofits? And I'm wondering if that's just a one-off or do you think that this is something that's going on? What are your thoughts on this? It's a great question. I actually think it's pervasive and it's not just nonprofits. I, I believe in what we see and it's part of what we recommend, you know, from a, a business advisory and technology consulting perspective is um, the first thing you need to do is think about your how, how your, um, you know, your entire system is secured, not just from the outside in, as we talked about earlier, but from the, you know, internally mm -hmm. privacy settings, where is your data stored, who has access to it today. And so we spend a lot of time with uh, with clients doing things like tenant assessments for their you know their Microsoft properties and understanding you know if they use Microsoft where's where is that data stored, um, who has access to it, and sort of helping them rationalize that because that that along with the structured data is really the key to what how AI will work, mm -hmm. and then that also includes the perimeter that includes. Who can use things like um, you know ChatGPT or open source tools to uh, to do this sort of work and what goes in and out? Those are the things that are so important for organizations to understand. The reality is, is those are attainable, but you need to start there and then allow your users and employees and others to use AI. Mm -hmm. It is, and it doesn't matter, by the way, if it's a if it's a one of the regulated industries, whether that's financial services or, or um, you know, healthcare with HIPAA and all those other things. Those things are covered by the right publisher and providers. Those are questions you need to ask up front. Yeah, this is a huge issue because I think a lot of times we think, oh, you know, if you're in development, you're like, oh, we just need to protect our donors' information and our donor data. 
And then it's like, hello, if you're in programming, you need to be looking at your clients. And then if you are working with funders, you got to look at that. And then if you're working with government contracting, you got to look at that. And those are all different people, different groups within an organization. It can be pretty perilous if you haven't thought this through. There's no question. And, and in that, that's why we've spent a lot of time t talking about not necessarily how you use AI, but what you need to do to get ready for it. And I think this is a big part of that, again, is it's possible. My, my message would be AI is completely possible in your organization, mm -hmm. but you need to be ready for it before you start using it. Yeah, fascinating. You know, this is a, a, a question from out of left field. You go, let's say you roll, Jeff Hensel, you roll into a nonprofit in, say, Dallas, Texas, and they want to, you know, em envelop their systems into using AI um, from everything from fundraising, programming, grant management, HR, and accounting. How long should we think about what this is going to take? Like, how long is, is it going to take for our organizations? to really understand what the process is, roll it out. As you said yesterday, get some quick wins. What does that even look like? Well, I think there are ways that you can pick and choose really quick wins in a secure way. And I do think that the content creation, the, the idea that you want some help editing or understanding, you know, kind of beyond the red squiggly on in a word document sort of what's how could i improve on this what are other words i could use that sort of thing what are some images that might make sense that are copyright protected and i can adjust uh, through through ai there, those things are all completely possible again you have to go back to making sure you have that framework in place internally from an infrastructure standpoint so that you're you're good to do that but then you can see that those benefits in weeks, not months. And I do think the, we talked a little bit about, we've talked a lot about the people aspect of this. That starts bringing people on board with, hey, this isn't scary. It's not that difficult. Right. I've learned how to talk to it and here's how it's helping me. And then I think it actually accelerates from there. So content creation is a great way to start. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that you would bring that up um, because that is one of those things that the digital component of reaching out to our donors and our stakeholders has created this like beast of content creation that we've got to just crank these things out. So many organizations feel, you know, hogtied to their content creation and they're super frustrated by it because they're getting behind further and further, right? And so to talk that you would bring that up is fascinating to me, that that could be like an entry point uh, for those people. It, and it's one of the easiest ones, in, in my opinion, because if you look at some commercially available tools today, things like um, you know Microsoft Copilot, where you can, if you have all of your mission, vision statements, sort of your latest report out, you can yeah. take that, attach it in in a chat with the bot if you will and say create a tweet that <laughs> summarizes this and mm -hmm. highlights the top three things you know donors should know yeah. and that's really powerful because it saves so much time from having to do it yourself and then you can you know there's ways you can actually publish it to the channel from there it, it's those are the types of things that are make a big difference in for, especially for nonprofits where they they're struggling to have to get the right people yeah. in the organization and to uh you know keep them on board and and all those other things so right well and i would imagine jeff that you know you're looking at a team it might be a team of one or you know a, a little bit more developed team um in marketing and communications that has the ability to maybe get something done once a quarter versus using this technology and getting something done every week or every month. You, you could create a, a pretty easily create a rhythm depending on what you wanted to do, where it was weekly, monthly, or certainly more frequently. 
so that you stay in front of the message you want to deliver and all those other things. So sales and marketing is one that is one of the easiest conversations to have relative to the usefulness of AI. And I believe, I have to believe to your example earlier, that's probably where they were trying to use it and needed to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the pressure of getting these communications out, it's so, so arduous. And then, you know, you're already, you're just killing yourself to get something out and then it's already old news. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then it's, you had one shot and we know that in marketing, it's, it's never a one and done. It's a continual feeding of, it's, of a drip. Yep. it's a drip. A drip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about what's next and how we can build on AI success. We spoke yesterday about the win, um, getting some things where everybody on your team feels comfortable and they can see that this is going to, you know, change the way they work for the better, help them, all of these things. But how do we grow this? Well, it's a flywheel effect. Once you have the foundation in place, uh, the reality is, is, is it's no different than any other skill. Okay. I think that one of the big things, and it goes back a little bit to the governance conversation we had earlier in the week. Once you start using AI in specific roles or capabilities, you feel good about your environment and it's secured. You've, you've, you understand as an organization where you want to go with it. Mm -hmm. That's really the opportunity to build on that relative to bringing the individuals who are using it into the larger organization, help having them ideate on how else could we use this in the organization? Yeah. Because one of the things that we've learned even internally as we've rolled out uh, Microsoft Copilot and other AI tools is when people start using the tool, they have all these great ideas on how else they could use it. And that could be for content creation. It could be for data manipulation. It could be for, you know, how do we do a better uh, job answering questions internally through an internal chat bot, that sort of thing. And once you sort of a, you get it started and, and, and unleash mm -hmm. the, the, con, the concept and the context, yeah. people are get excited. They learn it. It's no different than any other skill. It's, if you if you learn a new language and you start becoming proficient at it and you go to that country, I think it just kind of builds from there. It's an example I would give. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, Jeff, we talked about this on Monday. You only know what you know and your brain, you know, is plastic and it shifts. Right. And mm -hmm. so when you do some new things and then you have success, you, you said this yesterday several times. You need to have some quick wins. You need to reduce the fear. You need to reduce the notion that this is going to make worse a situation or replace somebody, right? Uh, people that are afraid of losing their jobs because they think some, something can take, take over. Um, and so I think this has just been fascinating. I really, really do. Um, you know, hard to believe our time is almost up. Um, I want to briefly touch base on coping with AI and team challenges. We, we talked yesterday about people first, and I hate to like push you along, but can you give us some ideas about what we can do to strengthen the, the positivity of this engagement? I, so I, I'll just recap a little bit of what we talked about yesterday, which is make sure that leadership is bought in and aligned. Make sure that you have people who are going to use it, can commit to using it and learning it, and then have them be points of light in the organization mm -hmm. and learn from that. And then, and then use that as a framework for how you do the next thing. It might all be good. Some of it might not, but learn from that and then iterate. That's really, in a nutshell, the best way to think about uh, people management relative to AI. There's lots of frameworks around it, but I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I love that. I, I think that um, for me, this was not something I expected you to say. Uh, and Miko certainly amplified this as well during our conversations this week, that this is a people first issue if you want to be truly successful and if you want to be uh, stable. Right. If you if you think about your organization that way and how everyone's working. Um, it, it opens up a lot more opportunities. This has been a fascinating conversation, Jeff. 
Um, I feel like we need two weeks of this because it's been so much information. Um, if you've missed any of our prior episodes, we've discussed just the general sense of AI and nonprofits, how you can prepare your nonprofit for tech success. Um, as Jeff said, it's not like buying a toaster, plug it in and voila, you're good to go. And then how do you win with tech and AI? How do you encourage your people and let them to understand what it means to be successful and how they can go? Today, we talked about getting started. What are some of those processes and the actual time it might take and where you might start. And then tomorrow, it's going to be really interesting. We have had a bunch of questions that have come in and we are going to go through those questions with Jeff and Miko and really look at some um, answering your questions about what this looks like for you and your organization. Um, and that's going to be how we wrap things up. Another thing that we want to wrap up with today are our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. Jeff, you're going to come back tomorrow, I hope, right? I will be back. I've, been, I've enjoyed the week very much, so I appreciate the opportunity. Good. It's been really fun. You've taught me a lot. Um, I think more than anything, you've reset my uh, my mind, <laughs> my mindset and the way I approach some of these things. Um, because when I'm out and about, everybody's talking about this. And um, it's really interesting to think that we are on the cusp of something so powerful. And, you know, in 24 months, this will just be the way we work. We won't think about so many of these things, right? It'll just be, we've adopted and we've created new structures. And so it's fascinating to be talking about this now. Yeah, I think we're at an inflection point and I think we've been for a few months. It's this technology is changing fast. And I think it's, you, you need to at least understand it and start embracing it, but do it the right way. But do it the right way. Absolutely. Well, another thing that you need to do the right way is how you look at your work in your mindset. And we end each and every episode with this message. And it goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.